Yang amat berbahagia, Tun Musa Hitam, former Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia, yang berhormat, Senator Tan Sri Datuk Sri Utama, Dr. Rais Yatim, President of the Dewan Negara, yang berhormat, Datuk Johari Abdul, Speaker of the Dewan Rakyat, yang berhormat, Tuan Muhammad Rafizi Ramli, Minister of Economy, yang berbahagia, Datuk Nur Yahati Awang, Chief Administrator of Parliament of Malaysia, Honourable Members of Parliament, Members from the Diplomatic Corps, Friends from the Media, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to all. On behalf of Parliament of Malaysia, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all participants to Parliament Lecture Series 1.0, Resetting the Malaysian Economy. The Parliament Lecture Series is an event co-organized by the President of the Dewan Negara and the Speaker of the Dewan Rakyat. This event was first initiated in 2019 by Tan Sri Datuk Muhammad Arif bin Mat Yusof, the ninth Speaker of the Dewan Rakyat, and it was known then as the Speaker's Lecture Series. Before we pro proceed any further, I would like to invite Encik Muhammad Sujairi Abdullah, Secretary of the Dewan Negara, to recite a prayer to bless this auspicious event. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Segala puji bagi Allah, Tuhan sekalian alam. Salawat dan salam ke atas junjungan Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ahli keluarganya dan para sahabatnya sekalian. Ya Allah yang bersifat mahikmah, kami memohon ihsan darimu. Bagi kami yang berhimpun di sini untuk menyatakan komitmen dan iltizam memartabatkan serta memperkasakan Parlimen Malaysia dalam mendukung dan menyokong usaha-usaha percambahan idea, pengukuhan institusi legislatif, demokrasi, dasar-dasar dan hala tuju negara. Ya Allah, dengan berkatmu kami memohon agar program Parlimen Lecture Series 1.0 yang bertajuk Resetting the Malaysian Economy memberi natijah positif kepada khalayak yang hadir khususnya kepada Malaysia amnya yang seterusnya menzahirkan hasad keterangkuman peradaban yang kita cita-citakan dan akan lahir terbangun satu generasi Malaysia madani yang punya sifat-sifat tuntas kendiri yang mampan sejahtera berdaya cipta saling menghormati berkeyakinan dan bersifat ihsan bagi memacu kelangsungan ekonomi Malaysia ke arah yang lebih maju dan berketerampilan Allahumma ya zal jalali wal ikram. With the ever-changing environment, grant us the strength to learn and the courage to correct mistakes and pave the way towards success. May the cultivation of ideas today make for a more humane and improved policies to move forward. Fortify our cooperation and bridge our gap. Unite our hearts and foster our friendship in the spirit of solidarity. Consolidate our efforts to achieve excellence and glory for our nation. Allahumma ya fatah ya alim, let your blessing descend upon us, inspire us with bright ideas and thoughts, firm stance and true comprehension. Grant us with continuous good health and well-being, halal sustenance and all goodness in this world to this day and days hereafter. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah, wa fil akhirati hasanah, wa qina adhab al-nar, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amin, amin, ya Rabbal Alamin. Thank you, Encik Sujairi. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we start with the opening address, allow me to introduce the first speaker for today for the benefit of the wider audience. I'm sure this is just a small portion of his achievement. 
Yang berhormat, Senator Tan Sri Datuk Sri Utama, Dr. Rais Yatim is currently serving as the 18th President of the Dewan Negara since September 2020. He was a Cabinet Minister in multiple key ministerial posts from 1974 to 2013 and the 5th Menteri Besar of Negeri Sembilan from 1978 to 1982. He was also the Member of Parliament for Jelebu from August 1974 to May 2013. Tan Sri is also a lawyer by profession and he obtained his LLB from the University of Singapore with a distinction in comparative law in 1973. In 1994, he was awarded a PhD in law from the King's College London. So without further ado, Please welcome the President of the Dewan Negara for his opening speech. Assalamualaikum. Salam sejahtera dari mana hendak ke mana, dari sana hendak ke sini. Bagaimana tuan-puan malam ini, bagaimana semoga sehat dan abadi. I thought that would never come. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with the salam and with the pantun, I welcome you on behalf of my brother Yang Bohormat Datuk Johari Abdul, the Speaker of Dewan Rakyat, to this August meeting of ours this evening. And beyond that, I have to mention tonight that we will make this meeting as informal as possible so that you could interact visually as well as verbally. And tonight we have an array of dignitaries with us. And on top of that, we have Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Musa Hitam, former Deputy Prime Minister. You know, in my kampung, we have this saying, Makan kerupuk bulat-bulat kalau nak bertepuk kuat-kuat. <laughs> oh, it's nice to start the evening this way. And we have here Yang Berhormat Senator uh, Tan Sri Datuk Sri dan Yang Berhormat Muhammad Rafizi Ramli, a Minister of Economy from the uh, Jabatan Perdana Menteri. Persilakan. Honourable Members of Parliament, Tansri Tansri, Your Excellencies Ambassadors and High Commissioners, Tidak lupa yang berbahagia Datuk Nur Yahati Awang, a Chief Administrator of the Parliament of Malaysia, Ali-Ali yang berhormat dari kedua-dua Dewan, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. A very good evening and welcome to this joint August meeting of ours for the evening. This is to fulfill the first public speech series which we have to interact between the public and the Parliament of Malaysia. We have been going on with the selection of speakers and after my brother Datu Johari suggested that the two we should pick first should be Tun Musa Hitam and Yang Bahormat Rafizi Ramli. Thank you. If I do not speak in Bahasa, I will be thrown aback when I go back not only to Jelebu, but at the Jalan Tuanku Abdul Rahman. So bear with me with the Bahasa first. Salam bahagia dan selamat datang ke majlis Siri Ucapan Utama Parlimen Malaysia 
sesuatu acara yang sudah agak lama tidak diadakan oleh kerana wabak COVID-19 dan bahananya yang telah dialami. Saya serta adinda yang berhormat Datuk Johari Abdul, Speaker Dewan Rakyat, para yang berhormat Timbalan Speaker kedua-dua Dewan, Ketua Pendaftar dan Pentadbir serta warga Parlimen mengalu-alukan para hadirin dan def-def ke majlis siri ucapan umum ini. Kami amat berbangga dengan kehadiran para tamu pada malam ini. Khasnya tamu yang ulung, yang amat berbahagia Tun Musa Hitam bekas timbalan Perdana Menteri Malaysia serta yang amat berbahagia Tu Puan Zulaikha serta yang berhormat Saudara Rafizi Ramli Menteri di Jabatan Perdana Menteri yang sudi bersama kita menyampaikan pandangan dalam perspektif masing-masing. Penghargaan juga bagi tuan yang terutama para duta asing yang agak ramai hadir pada malam ini. Tan Sri Tan Sri, Datuk-Datuk, rakan-rakan lama dan para sahabat Parlimen Malaysia sekalian. Rakyat masih dalam musim pasca pilihan raya 15. Dan Perdana Menteri ke-10, Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim atau dengan akronimnya DSAI, DSAI dan para anggota pentadbirannya baru masuk ke kamar atau pejabat masing-masing lebih sedikit dua bulan. Laungan di musim kempen pilihan raya masih berdengung dan terdengar berkumandang. Dalam suara politician semasa berkempen lagi, mereka menjanjikan pelbagai hal, pelbagai perkara. Kegairahan mereka masih kita dengar. Malah lawak mereka pun kita masih ingat. Misalnya, bila harga minyak nak turun. Misalnya, macam mana rakyat nak dibela. Misalnya, cerita telur dan ayam. Juga kita baru dengar perkara-perkara lain yang berhadapan dengan kehidupan kita. Yang ahli-ahli yang berhormat sama ada dari Dewan Negara atau Dewan Rakyat menonjolkan perkara ini sebagai hal-hal yang perlu kita debatkan. Oleh yang demikian pada malam ini, masa tempoh berkempen mereka sudah selesai. Sejujurnya, kita harus menyatakan, berilah mereka ruang dahulu. Berilah mereka masa sedikit. Oleh kerana, para beliau itu baru lagi masuk pejabat dan lebih sedikit dua bulan. Dalam keadaan sebegitulah, kita rasakan perjumpaan kita pada malam ini merupakan perjumpaan rakyat dan lapisan kita melibatkan para ambassador ataupun duta-duta, pegawai-pegawai tinggi, bekas menteri besar, bekas menteri, kita juga ada di kalangan kita bekas ketua setiausaha negara serta mereka dulu yang memegang tampuk perjuangan negara kita. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with our two luminary speakers taking the recoil and getting ready with their respective delivery, allow me and Adinda Yang Bahormat Datuk Johari, our new speaker Dewan Rakyat, and our respective deputy speakers, as well as our Ketua Pentadbir and officials, to welcome you to this august session of parliamentary uh, public discourse. A hatching of idea, if you like, for discerning public issues. And a big thank you to Yang Ahmad Berbahagia Tun Musa Hitam and his charming wife, Tu Puan Zulaikha, 
Yang berhormat Saudara Rafizi Ramli, Minister in the PM's Department, in charge of economic matters. Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I should not be taking the floor to the extent of taking too much of your time. But being one of the fellow members of two day one, I have to stress that actually tonight, my brother Datuk Joe is supposed to be here speaking to you, not me. But what he told me was, the best is yet to come. You take the rostrum first. <laughs> After investigating, I come to know that he does this out of a tactic because tonight he has to fly to Algiers. And uh, while he is smiling to you all and to me now, his heart is somewhere else. But bear with me, we bid him good flight and good achievement in the OIC. If we are talking about economy tonight, I shouldn't be talking on the same topic. This topic is best given to Yang Berhormat Ladinda Saudara Rafizi and Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Musa himself. Therefore, I succumb to my own suggestion. That is, to give you a peep on the topic of legislative reform in the context of the Parliament of Malaysia. This is to say, this is to mean the speakers of both houses have to visualize what has been given to the public by three prime ministers. First, Tan Sri Mohyuddin Yassin. Second, Dato Sri Ismail Yaakob. And now the 10th Prime Minister, Desai, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. The three of them had been speaking about reform. And if you share the view that is being floated, in Bahasa we say, Kalau dilipat sekecil kuku, Kalau disebar seluas alam, because reform is such a big matter. It is as wide as the world, and it is as big as life itself. Therefore, for me to talk a little bit on legislative reform in the context of the Parliament of Malaysia would be just a little speck out of humanity and out of legislative priority for a country like Malaysia. Reform or reformasi has been a brandish thrust, especially by the 10th Prime Minister, since decades ago. And to be exact about it, no less than 30 years, reformasi has been heard. Reformasi, before he went to Kajang and to Sungai Buloh, reformasi after he came out from Sungai Buloh and Kajang, and reform Masi, after Tun Mahade promised him in two weeks, in three weeks, in one month. So the tumultuous period of the 10th Prime Minister must be recorded to be the challenging reform Masi that we are talking today. But when we were together at his office three weeks ago, we asked him, which part of reform Masi could we talk about? He didn't answer us. He said, reformasi. So with that, I've got a license tonight. My reformasi, with that of my brother, Joe, is to spell out what we have been talking about, the Parliament of Malaysia. And that question is embedded in the very crux of democracy itself. And that is, is the Parliament of Malaysia within the context of the separation of powers. If it is not, could we bring it into that category of having parliament, that is the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive, well demarcated? 
So that issue is to us legislative reform in the context of this parliament. Now, we have been talking about logo. During Dato Sri Ismail Sabri's time, there was Keluarga Malaysia, family of Malaysia. And then, before that, during the time of Tan Sri Mohirin, we have got nomenclatures like Abah and Makiah. Then now, we have got Madani, Masyarakat Madani. During the time of the esteemed Tun Musa and Tun Dr. Mahathir, at that time, Datuk Sri Dr. Mahathir, they had the two M. They have bersih, cekap, dan amanah. <laughs> what we are saying is, every premier has his logo, has his sentence. And this is well said, and this is within the vision of a political leader. But what about the Keluarga Malaysia? What about the Madani society? What about the Abah and the Makia? And beyond that, how about the value system that we want to revamp? That is not reformasi? To me, it is. Because unlike law, the nomenclature for reformasi or transformation is not defined. Thus, the more we have of change, good change for the people, the better it is. Is this going to be good for the consumers? Is this going to be good for the fishermen, for the patani or the rubber tappers? Is this going to be good for democracy? So coming back to parliament, we would like to share this reformation. And where we have left, we would like to go back and pick it up. Where we have forgotten, we would like to get it back into the fold. But this is the very entity. This is the very house that will bring about change. And if this house is not reformed to the extent that it is accepted as a separate entity that will qualify for A.V. Dicey's rule of law, then we might not have achieved what we have been wanting to achieve over the decades. Allow me to bring you to a speech by our first Prime Minister in 1955. That is about 68 years ago. Tunku Abdul Rahman, our first PM, came out with the following excerpt in the first local government campaign speech in 1955. Kita akan bersama-sama membina negara dan rakyat tanah Melayu dengan kebaikan dan keikhlasan melalui kepercayaan agama dan budaya masing-masing. What he meant was that we should build nation, the nation or nation building should be faced on goodness, sincerity, religion, and faith. And this is for every community. Well, the first prime minister has been right all along. And today, when we talk about the reformation, these words which he said in 1955 resound again to us as a young nation. Therefore, on that balmy afternoon of 20th September 2021, that's about two years ago, there was this MOU or Memorandum of Understanding entered into by the government of the day whose head was Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob on the one hand and Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim being the leader of the opposition. The MOU, in our view, is the document that started the ball rolling in terms of ideas. That is to say, within the context of the language, 
the following words were said. To restore the country's political and economic revival and to reform initiatives on governance, strengthen the role of parliamentary institutions. Alhamdulillah, thank God. The word parliamentary institutions are there. Therefore, myself and brother Dato Jo, we thought it is best that we float this idea again so that it becomes reality. How do we go about it? We looked again at the document. There you are. We have the topic of political funding law must be created. We must bring in the necessity for the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission to be under the watch of parliament and not to be under the watch of a certain department. We have there in that document, ethics for MPs and ADUN. ADUN is Ahli Dewan Undangan Negeri. Those who serve at the legislative uh, entities at state level, they are called ADUN. General orders for elected members of the legislature. The civil servants have got their general orders. We don't. Being part of parliament, being the speaker, and being MPs, we don't. So, for lawyers, the thing that kindled in our mind is, what about Article 8 of the Constitution? The equality part. Are we equal in facing the law? Uh, this is the issue. Thank God, the MOU included that idea in. Then we have the vision of rule of law mechanism. In other words, the MOU of 20th September 2021, signed by the government then and the various members and leaders of the opposing parties, has been in document form one of those glaring clarion to call us for reform. Therefore, oleh sebab itu, maka transformasi dan reformasi yang disebut oleh Datuk Sri Anwar itu bukanlah sesuatu yang harus tinggal terapung di udara tetapi harus kita jadikan sebagai lambang dan juga pentadbiran yang boleh menterjemahkannya kepada masyarakat yang kita inginkan. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> of course since 20th September 2021 and now there has been a big flow of water in the river downstream. And after the 15th general election, people start to ask again, are those things spelled out in the MOU going to be realities? Or are they the subjects of mere rhetorics? Again, allow me to refer to our meeting our means between me and my brother Dato Jo Johari with the Prime Minister about three weeks ago, he assured us that he would like via his government to bring about these changes. Dato Jo and I were happy. We are still. And we tell each other, let us work for this. And let us make it happen, meaning our parliament should be separate and distinct from the judiciary and the executive. But we have been talking about this the whole period since Merdeka, 1957, and now. And yet, the administration of parliament is still controlled by the government of the day via a department. In other words, if you want to buy a bus, I and brother Dato Joe cannot allow it, cannot make it happen. We have to go to a department to get the okay. Certainly, that is not the way. Certainly, this is not 
the matter to be taken lightly. And hence, we put forward the view that the period for change is happening, and to make that happen, we have to ask one question. How do we change the scenario? I answered it in, the, in a uh, short sentence. We change the law. You will agree with me, no doubt. No change in bureaucracy, no change in government if the law is not changed. Uh, A.V. Dicey had said in his treatise in 1951, the law speaks for all, and the law for all is equality. From there, we pick it up. And then, as we see this, these things happen, in the meantime, during and after the 15th uh, general election, I would like to say that some candidates in the general election who lost suddenly, they became ministers. You lost, but you become ministers. Then, the winners, they don't have anything. Now, is that fair in terms of rule of law, in terms of uh, democratic process? Maybe you would like to answer that later and ask the panelists. Secondly, <clears throat> we have heard these words, no ANWA, no DAP, and no Bersatu. What happened after that? So, in the admixture of rule of law, in the admixture of wanting to reform, this had happened after the elections. But to make it into a reality of questionable level, that will not be my answering tonight. Therefore, this synopsis have hitherto become standard flashcards in the social media. TikTok and talk tick. Uh, I'm putting the pun there. There's only TikTok, there's no uh, talk tick. It has made the rounds in the country, and values have changed overnight. When electoral losers become winners, and winners become losers, and tonight, here we are. We talk about transformacy. Well, well let us pick it up a little bit more. And uh, right away, I would like to go and delve into the separation of power matrix. This can be a bit involved, but I will try to make it brief so that the affordable thinking process could be applied after this. What do you mean by parliament to be uh, independent? It means you have to have your own financial resource. You have to have your own administrative resource. You can determine internally the operation of parliament, as it is for Congress, as it is for House of Commons, as it is for House of Lords. But here, we are not yet achieving that level. Therefore, to be within the process and reality of transformacy, we need to change the law. There are two laws that we have thought uh, should be put in the front line. Firstly, it concerns the 1963 Parliamentary Services Act, 1963. Before the year 2002, the Parliament of Malaysia was at liberty to construe, to level, to determine, in other words, to administer its own administrative needs. But after 2002, the Act was put in abeyance. In other words, no more in use for Parliament. I need not go into detail why, but it can be answered by the Bahasa idiom. That is, sekali air bah, sekali pantai berubah. Once the flood comes, the shoreline changes. So, after 2002, the 1963 Act was in abeyance. Therefore, the Jabatan Perkhidmatan Awam took over 
parliament. And the rest is a matter of rigmarole. Who comes here or who is transferred, who goes up or who goes down is no concern of the speakers. It is a concern of a department outside of parliament. So that illustrates the point. Number two is we do not have the independence of financial outlay. Therefore, we are not in the position to determine our own financial resource. It is determined by the ministry. Now, our answer to this is, and all the three prime ministers <laughs> have agreed, we should revert to square one. To relive and to reenact the 1963 Act, but with a little addition, we create a majlis or a board, and the board should be chaired together by the Speaker of Dewan Rakyat and the Speaker of the Senate. Inside, we have got the representative from the Treasury, from the Jabatan Perdana Menteri, and from the other resource departments. But Parliament controls its own financial and administrative needs. And therefore, the summary is this. Uh, we don't have a very difficult position if the 1963 Act is put back into force. Tan Sri, Dato' Dato' hadirin yang dikasihi sekalian, ada satu lagi akta yang seharusnya kita pindah, yaitu akta 1952, yaitu akta keistimewaan dan kuasa Parlimen 1952. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the next act of parliament to be introduced in terms of a little amendment is the 1952 Parliament Houses Privilege and Power Act 1952. It is still in force, but we have not publicized it. Under that law, both speakers have got executive powers in terms of controlling the behavior of Ahli Parliament or MPs or Senators in terms of if they do not keep the decorum, if they do not behave themselves in manner that is deemed to be proper parliamentarily, both speakers can take action. But you may ask, there have been instances where members of Parliament here have uttered four letter words, they have shown the middle finger, they have done other things, and they have even defied the speaker. Tan Sri Arif Yusuf pun faham bagaknya ni sebab beliau bersama-sama mengalami perkara ini. Apatah lagi speaker kita yang lain. That is deemed a wrongful act under the act. But uh, this is the difficult part. The enforcement of that act is not very clear. Therefore, we would like to clarify that the optimum behavior, the acceptable quorum, must be observed at all times. We have suggested in a little way of amendment that the fine should be increased and the standing orders of parliament should be in conformity with the 1952 Act. Historically, this act was used in the Federal Council system of Malaya before independence. Hence, the 1952 number there, the year is 1952. We became independent in 1957. How come it's a 1952 act? But by virtue of its usefulness, by virtue of its significant contribution for controlling the behavior of parliamentary members, in South Africa, we got that into our system. And now it is still good law. It is not put into abeyance, it is still there. Therefore, we are suggesting that the two laws be amended. And that will answer the question, will the Parliament of Malaysia in, be in conformity with the new aura of reformacy? For us, that is good enough first. 
The members of parliament in this country are not given training. But the civil servants are. The civil servants have got the intern training program where they know what to do, they have the de decorum factor, and they have the do's and don'ts for public service. But the early parliament, tidak ada. And hence, perhaps, we both of us thought that this should be the order of the day. Secondly, we should be training the young, the school leavers, the university students, to become leaders of the future. And my brother is very fond of this topic, and therefore I air it out tonight, that in the parliament belia, or the youth parliament of this country, we will introduce retraining and training for the young. But at the same time, the need for the present leaders of parliament to be trained and to be exposed to the value system of being an MP, that is priority. Now, some may say, oh, we don't need it because we are leaders. Well, every leader has to be groomed in a way that is possible. During my time and during the times of Tun Musa, we didn't have internet. We didn't have the portable <laughs> telephone. It was different. But today, a kid of 15 years can see pornography in broad daylight. That will change his idea. Every time he sees something, I would need not go beyond that, that the difficulty of present social structure has been imbued into many young leaders. And it is our hope that with this rearrangement, it could be done and the doing of it should be filling some of our needs. Rakan-rakan, tuan-tuan yang dikasih sekalian, uh, kalau diukur, perjalanan saya sudah panjang, jadi saya tidak mau lebih sudu daripada kuah. Sebab malam ini saya berucap sebagai tuan rumah sebenarnya bagi pihak adinda saya, Datuk Jo. Jadi peluang yang selepas ini harus saya berikan kepada beliau berdua. I hope your patience of silence can still be maintained when the two luminaries be speaking to you in a short while. I feel very uneasy when the audience is very quiet. Uh, one interpretation is they are hungry. The other is uh, they want to wait for something else. Don't worry, the two are coming. There is just one final thing that I would like to share with you tonight. We have talked about young MPs you know, who don't behave too well in the chambers. And we have talked about this 1952 Act where we can issue warrants when we, we can, both of us can arrest, both of us can fine. But we have not done that because we believe in the training. There is one matter in this country that has been left in the open, and that is the Ruku Negara. Ruku Negara or the, as the Panchasila of, of Indonesia, this is actually the vibrant ideology of the country after the 13 May 1969 incident. The five principles there are good pointers, are good rules of thought for nation building. From believing in the creator to the respect and allegiance to the king. From respecting the parliamentary laws to the constitution and to the social bind of our country, it's there. It has been mentioned every year. Every time we have Merdeka, we ask them to put their hands up. Up! And they put their hands up. And they recite the Ruku Negara. But beyond that, we do not follow it. Ruku Negara has become the illustrations of textbooks in the schools, but we have not given them the training. The extrapolation of values are not there. Hence, we are suggesting when the Belia Parliament comes into shape, we would urge the Kementerian Pendidikan or the 
education ministry to take it up and make it reality of nation building through schools, through the universities, through the army, through the police, through the civil servants, through the young Bahormat. Now, the young Bahormat, I think, is if listed in that list, could join us to formulate further and other reformations. In the meantime, the Rukun Negara has also been suggested it should become part and parcel of the constitution of the country, if not under a separate law by itself. We have not been doing national service for 10 years almost. Why don't we insert the Rukun Negara into the coalescence of Malaysian civilization or Malaysian social bind. Hadirin yang dikasihi sekalian, saya telah bercakap agak panjang lebar dan sudah sampai ke penghujungnya dan saya harapkan apa yang sempat disampaikan ini merupakan sesuatu yang boleh kita bersaham. Malaysia merupakan negara yang muda. Malaysia memerlukan segala pandangan yang baik. Dan kepada kerajaan kita yang baru dua bulan, kita berilah ruang kepada mereka. Termasuklah wakilnya di sini yang berhormat Adinda Rafizi untuk bersama-sama menjalankan tugas dan memberi kepuasan perjuangan kepada semua. In English, I would say that reforms as they bring goodness are reformative, hence laudable. But if the people are the worst for them, then we will be called the deformed. I hope we are not in that category after a few years starting from tonight. Dengan kata-kata itulah, saya sampaikan pantun, kalau berdentum di Gunung Daik, itulah tanda orang memerun. Berhimpunlah kita anak beranak. Kalau tersentuh waktu naik dan terlentung masa turun, berilah ampun banyak-banyak. For excellencies, ambassadors, that simply means, pardon me if I've committed something in trespass. <laughs> Dengan itu, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you, Yang Berhormat Tan Sri. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker for today is also a well-known political figure. Yang Berhormat Tuan Muhammad Rafizi Ramli is currently the Minister of Economy and serving his second term as the Member of Parliament for Pandan. He was first elected as MP for Pandan in May 2013. With that brief introduction, I would like to invite Yang Berhormat Tuan Muhammad Rafizi Ramli to deliver his lecture. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good evening. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Saudari pengisi majlis yang amat berbahagia, Tun Musa Hitam, former Deputy Prime Minister yang berhormat Senator Tan Sri Datuk Sri Utama Dr. Rais Yatim Presiden Dewan Negara Yang berhormat Datuk Johari Abdul Yang dipertua Dewan Rakyat Datuk Nuhi Hati Datuk Muntak B Members of Parliament from both houses Excellencies, Ambassadors and Members of the Diplomatic Corps Tan Sri Tan Sri, Datuk Datuk, ladies and gentlemen, it's um, quite surreal to be in 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 this August house um, because this was the house that I took my oath the first time around. 
back then the 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 original day one um, was under renovation so this was um, this is where I spent the most of the part of my first term as a um, member of parliament. It is also daunting um, and um, you have everyone looking at you. Um, I don't know how you feel um, in your respective seats because it's really cold. Um, and then we are wearing baju batik tonight. Yeah. Um, I grew up in even before in school, um, those was um, early 80s, I grew up in a kampung in Terengganu watching Tun Musa Hitam as Deputy Prime Minister all those years back. This is the first time I, I met Tun and then we are on the same stage. Um, I wonder if I had um, come across Tun Musa Hitam much earlier on when I was younger most probably you would have advised me not to come near to politics because there's so much drama. Um, I don't think I have a lot of time basically because you know we would like to hear from Tone as well and then I think we, we will have some time for Q&A. Um, so let's start um, with a very simple question. I am here to share with you my assessment, my diagnosis, um, a sharing about where the economy is, what are we going to do about it, and what to expect from this new government. Um, it's, you know, this is the first few times in the last 70 years where an economic function um, is given a full portfolio. Usually, the economic function is always with the Prime Minister, either with the Prime Minister himself or um, as a department under the Prime Minister. Um, I think it's only, this is only the second time. Tan Sri Wahid is here, my predecessor, all those years back. This is only the second time that the economic planning um, is given a full portfolio. And uh, Tan Sri Rais uh, did allude just now um, about how this government has come together. And among the first controversies, supposedly, was the fact that the Prime Minister is also a finance minister. Um, part of the design is to try to bring it back in terms of governance and separate between the fiscal responsibility and the long-term and mid-term economic planning. So previously, the long-term and mid-term economic planning resides with the Prime Minister when the economic planning unit um, was with the Prime Minister's department. The Finance Minister has always been um, responsible for the fiscal responsibility, the spending. Um, and uh, I although it was unconventional because we were used to a situation for the last 15 years, more than a decade, whereby it, everything basically is, is influenced by the finance minister. Now, hopefully, with the separation, um, we will be able to bring about some semblance of um, separation. Um, finance minister focus on day to day, um, the fiscal spending, the fiscal balancing, whereas the economic planning is done with more of the uh, mid term and long term perspective by the economic ministry. It also serves us quite um, well now because um, we have to go through a lot of tightening here and there, given the fiscal situation. It would have been a lot more difficult if you have someone else as a finance minister because you know you would have to entertain politics here and there, budget allocation here. It's a lot easier nowadays because every time a decision is made to cut spending or to reallocate resources, 
any appeal has to go through the prime minister because he is also the finance minister and so far it seems to be working quite well because every time there is an appeal every time there you know there's there's a um special cases um is a lot more difficult to go through a prime minister than for example a finance minister so coming back to the diagnosis you know the i have two parts of my work cut out uh the easy part and the more difficult part the easy part is the diagnosis because i think mostly people can understand and can agree on the diagnosis if you talk to the market if you talk to people who have gone through the process who were decision makers years and years before more or less we know what are the diagnosis um what are the challenges what are the risks where it will go if certain reforms are not put in place um and i i i take a great comfort that after almost 2 months um all the feedback and all the consultations almost come on the dot when it comes to diagnosis which which i will come a bit later after this the harder part of my job and by extension this government's job is now that you know the diagnosis and you also more or less know the prescriptions to actually do it and successively over the last 10 15 years we have known the diagnosis we knew what prescriptions should be in place but either we got distracted or we lack the political will or it seems so monstrous that we don't know where to begin and you know what started as a symptom eventually will you know come to a stage where we are now in a situation where the fiscal space is very tight um to continue with the practices and the policies of the past few years to explain it in a much easier terms especially to the younger ones or to those who perhaps um you know do not spend as much looking at the charts and 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 the economic numbers um i think it's a problem that is akin to what most of us go through in our daily lives every day um is almost like an you know overweight problem i struggle with overweight problem every day every month you know almost every year you roughly know what your ideal weight should be you measure your weight every now and then and constantly you are reminded that um, you're getting worse because you're getting fatter um you have to change your wardrobe every now and then you also know that if you don't get fit if you don't get healthier you know what started as a minor weight problem and then becomes obesity eventually you will get stuck with a myriad of other problems you know diabetes cardio problem and so on and so forth the prescription is also quite simple you know that is a function of calorie balance you have to eat less or if you want to eat as much you have to run more you have to burn more calories every day simplest prescription um you go to any doctors you go to any dietitian you go to any gym they will tell you exactly the same thing most of us despite the very simple diagnosis and the very simple prescriptions most of us struggle with it people make billions trying to get people to keep fit that's more or less i think where we are now as an economy as a country um we know the symptoms we know the diagnosis we actually know with this kind of fiscal space and trajectory and i will get that you know after this um it will get worse and worse and worse uh so it takes a lot of courage and political will and cohesion of every stakeholder in the ecosystem and that includes all of you um it's not just the government it's not just the public it's not just 
current, present decision makers, but also past statesmen and decision makers, and definitely a lot of our partners within this global trade ecosystem that we operate in, um, our trading partners. Um, and it takes a lot of coordination, and most importantly, it takes a lot of political and mindset shift so that we can move in cohesion. And once I think we pass the first few difficult steps, and then hopefully the momentum of it will become easier and easier. And I can relate to that because I used to be more overweight than this when I was in politics in my first term. I used to be very fat. So, um, I tried everything after I quit politics after 2018 to basically keep fit because by then I realized that if I don't do something, um, it's, it's, it's not going to be pleasant health-wise. Um, you try dieting, you try medicine, so to speak, you try subscribing to so many things, but at the end of the day, it's just a simple routine of walking and running at certain speed and pace of certain hours, of certain distance every day, of balancing and cutting um, simple but very harmful habits. For example, eating after seven. And true enough, after six, seven months, you know, you get lighter, you can run faster, and then all those things, when you look back, that you felt so difficult to do, actually came quite naturally after a while. Um, of course, now I'm back in politics after about eight months, I'm fat again. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly reminded trying to do what I'm trying to do now with my job to understand that the first few steps are usually the hardest. And once we get everything, the cocks and wheels moving and it gets lighter, and I think two, three years down the line, um, I think we will feel very differently about the direction of the economy. We will start seeing whatever structural reforms that we want to do trickling down. And I think Malaysia can once again um, take pride that where we are now, which is basically we are you know, in a classroom, we are more or less that smart guy who usually score quite well in exams, but don't often get noticed by the teachers or everyone else. Somehow there's something missing because result-wise you are good, but people actually think that you are left behind. That's exactly where we are as a country. If you look at our economic growth, if you look at our potentials, if you look at how well diversified we are as an economy, we have a lot of potentials. From 2019, 2020, 2021 and 2022, despite going through more than two years of lockdown, on average, our economy grows about 3% plus. In fact, for 2022, Malaysia is expected to be the best performing economy in this region. So we roughly did really well. But if you go and talk to the international community, when you talk to investors, even if we look at our um, stock exchange performance, somehow people will always say that, you know, Philippines are more sexy for the investors. People talk about Indonesia. People do not talk about Malaysia lately in the same breath of our peers when our resilience is so much better than our peers in this country. So that's why you know, I take comfort that as an economy, as a society, we are very resilient. We have all the ingredients, all the strengths. Um, we have all the lessons learned in the past that will be able to put us back as a top performer, as a top student, so to speak, in a classroom, where a teacher look in a class of pupils and say, that's my guy. And that's basically what we are trying to do. And we have to start with the diagnosis and 
you know, I'm hoping that we communicate this well, not just with learned crowd like this, but also to the public generally, that we have three major challenges. The first one is we have to consolidate our fiscal position. As an economy, our growth is quite respectable. Um, 2023 is expected um, to see a global recession, for example, but we are expected to grow at about 4%. We are expected to buck the trend. So as an economy, if you talk to economists generally, you know, Malaysia is actually doing quite well. But you don't feel it. The government doesn't feel it. If you talk to um, consumers, people on the street, um, and this, I think, was the mistake of the previous few administrations. There is no correlation by now between economic headline figures and what people feel on the ground. You can hit good growth number, you can show good FDI, our stock exchange can be performing so well, but generally, since I began tracking economic sentiment since 2016, people actually feel worse and worse and worse on the ground. And that's why there is a disconnect between the government's and the economy's performance with what people feel how the government has been performing. Um, and the reason for that is, it's not so much about the economy, it is about the fiscal position. Um, we have been spending, um, and that spending has been growing by leaps and bounds on things like subsidies that started out with a good intention, but given everything that has been happening globally uh, with uh, crude oil prices shooting up, we have um, global supply chain disruptions, we have you know, the war in, in uh, Ukraine and Russia, and then we have COVID for two years. Um, what started as a small um, subsidy is now, if you're not careful and if you don't do something about it, will easily take up between 30 to 40% of um, our uh, operating budget every year. So if you think about it, right? Out of 100 ringgit that we have to spend every year to manage this country, 30% say has to go to keeping prices as how people would like it to be. Another 20% plus to pay for interest. And the rest most probably is to pay for emoluments. And obviously emoluments will keep going up and then at the rate we are going, subsidies will keep going up. So unless we do something about it, our fiscal position will become thinner and thinner and that will take away the country's ability to allocate resources, especially on investments or capital or development expenditure that can redirect and refocus this economy towards those sectors that we have to be. So um, we all have been talking about it. We have to start rationalizing our you know, subsidy bill. We have to move towards targeted subsidy. We have to make sure there are no leakages. We have to manage between the public expectation about prices as well as not getting addicted too much to keeping prices artificially low. So that's known. The second challenge is to broaden our revenue base. Um, as a country in this region, Malaysia is in the bottom three. Bottom three, only above Maj um, Laos actually, in terms of the percentage of tax revenue out of GDP. So out of the total economy every year, the amount that finally comes back to government as tax revenue, if you take that figure to, to assess our fiscal strength and resilience of the government's uh, fiscal position year after year, we rank above Laos and more or less at Indonesia's level. Which means that despite um, respectable growth, 
if we don't fix this, um, it will not be able to resolve a lot of the problems because the government spending and fiscal position is very limited. The economy can grow, companies can make money, but we just don't have enough money to move to the next um, speed and pace, so to speak. So broadening the tax base is, is, um, is no longer an option. It's something that, that we have to put in place very quickly, um, especially if we expect the next two, three years um, to be very challenging globally. Um, if there is a recession, the spillover will come to Malaysia and obviously whatever we already have in terms of um, revenue, um, we might get less. And if we don't manage the subsidy and all the others, um, obviously our fiscal position gets worse and worse. And that brings us to the third challenge, which is to restructure the economy. And of course, everyone has been talking about it. Restructuring economy, restructuring economy, restructuring economy. If you talk to people from the men on the streets all the way to the CEOs, all the way to investors, venture capitalists, they would tell you the same thing. We must move up the value chain from one that is based on low-wage, manufacturing-driven economy to one where it's service-based, where there is a high tech and value content. Um, but obviously, it's easier said than done um, because um, it requires so many things. Um, we have to refocus and pivot our technical skill training. Nowadays, for example, when investors want to relocate to Malaysia or expand in Malaysia, it's no longer just about incentives or tax policies. It is more about our ability to provide the right skill workforce for them. Because we are no longer in that low value, low wage manufacturing base. Um, we have to move one, two tiers much higher than our peers. And, and that, that proves to be quite difficult, at least for the last one or two decades, for example. We have to restructure the economy in terms of um, digitization. Um, we can unlock one or two percent GDP growth if we close our digitization gap, not just in the economy, but especially in government services. Because the more you digitize, hopefully, the more efficient it is, the more saving, the faster and the more voluminous transactions will be. So all these challenges are known. The diagnosis basically is um, consistent no matter which parties you sit down with. The difficulties, which is the difficult part, is how exactly to get started. Um, I hope um, with the current government, uh, with a very strong majority, this is, I think, on record, the most stable majority government and administration that we have had since 2004. I hope that allows us the five years that is needed to bite all the bullets that we need to do. And whatever key decisions that we have to do when it comes to subsidy rationalization, broadening the tax base, pivoting our focus towards a more value-adding um, service economy, that has to happen sooner rather than later. And by that, I mean in this one or two years. In fact, in the next nine months. Because it will take time, when, after a decision has been made, it will take time before the implementation kicks in. And the window before the political um, situation um, gets murkier, because for every one year you don't move, you move closer to an, a, a, the next general election. And politics in Malaysia is a lot less predictable than during the time of Tan Sri Rais and also Tun Musa Hitam. It's very difficult to tell how things will turn out to be. So 
I hope with this strong mandate in Parliament that we have, we will be able to make all the key decisions that have eluded um, previous administrations. Um, we also have to see things and do things differently. You know, Tanjri Halim is here. I've spent the last um, 60 days sitting down with, with my ministry and I inherit EPU for, for the planning. Um, my KSU is here. Among the things that I realize is that um, in the past, um, policies are made and there are ways that policies will just filter and get implemented. But back then, things, are not, things did not move and the economy was not as dynamic as it is now. So if in the past we can approach economic planning and economic management with much longer term perspective, um, it's a lot more dynamic nowadays that even the planning has to be a lot more agile than before. Previously, we can do a five-year term planning, put it in place, and then allow it to be implemented and see how the economy reacts to it. Nowadays, the ability to review and then to take feedback and then to adjust very quickly to the changing environment, which we call the agility to it, it requires, for example, a mindset shift even among policymakers and civil service to understand that if we were to be that agile, we have to allow for mistakes to be made. There is no such thing that one plan and it will allow it to happen for five years and therefore people spend so much time trying to get so-called the perfect plan. There's no such thing anymore. It's, it's always learning, iterating, trying, getting the feedback. So that is actually quite alien even in our delivery service. So there is a need to really shift from all the practices, all the processes that we have had in government and to move to, um, to be more responsive, more agile. Again, easier said than done because we are talking about, you know, a way of things that have been in place for more than 100 years. Um, I'll just take another two minutes soon, and then because um, most probably there'll be questions and the rest we'll, we'll, we'll cover during the Q&A. One other example for um, digitization, we talk about digitization, everyone except that government of all organizations in this country have to move faster with digitization. But the approach to digitization requires a lot of rethinking about how we even manage digitization. Um, in the past, uh, many organizations in this country, and not just the government, look at digitization as an IT project. You draw up your specifications, you put it out, someone's develop it, you use it, a few years down the line, you say, we need to upgrade it. We need to upgrade it. You know? But if the whole of government service delivery is based on digital platform and digitization, that most probably will no longer work. Because we have to govern through digital. We no longer look at digitization as an interface. And that again requires a lot of rethinking about how we grow, how we um, um, so-called structure our civil service and our support services and so on. This is the part that is actually a much bigger challenge than all the diagnoses, all the um, macroeconomic um, inflation growth numbers that we've had so far. At the end of the day, anyone in my position can only do either one of these two things. Um, we can either look at the challenges and how monstrous we feel it is, 
and then um, you know we spend too much time on what can go wrong or we can look at all these challenges and see this as an opportunity is a question of whether do you look is a glass half empty or a glass half full and anyone in my position where well, it's an honor to have this opportunity to try to assist um i i i think the administration will approach it with this um, pride that you know this country has a lot of potential it is a a glass half full with a few important steps that require everyone on board um it'd be very quick before we catch up and we can sprint ahead i hope to be able to come here again um and you know i make a promise to both the president of dewan negara and speaker of dewan rakyat that every time either one of them preside over a session in this august house that is on economy i will attend and answer myself um i know that there are mps here some of them will sit in a very powerful new select committees um i expect to be summoned from time to time and to be grilled i will attend and answer myself and i hope within a year term 3 we will have this again so that when i come again next year a year from now we have a lot more optimism and i think whatever we set out to do we would have made a lot of progress within a year for that thank you very much and um let's chip in and as tanshri dr rais said in the beginning give us a bit of space and opportunity at least to prove that many things can be done despite how difficult and you know how complicated it is thank you very much and a very pleasant evening thank you yambur hormat Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is also a legendary figure in Malaysia. Yang amat berbahagia, Tun Musa Hitam served as the nation's fifth deputy prime minister from 1981 to 1986. He also served in the nation, he also served the nation in various key government posts including chairman of the Federal Land Development Authority or FELDA deputy minister of trade and industry minister of primary industry and minister of education yang amat berbahagia tuan musa also served as the chairman of Malaysian Human Rights Commission or better known as SUHAKAM from 1999 to 2002 He was also the founding chairman of the World Economic World Islamic Economic Forum Foundation until 2021. I am honored to invite Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Musa Hitam to the podium to deliver his lecture. I like this silence. It's much a sign of anticipation. But I want to tell you frankly that tonight I feel somewhat out of place as well as being out of date. Why do I say so? It is because 
I took the trouble to think and think and think how to deal with tonight's subject. After all the trouble, thinking and thinking and thinking, I was listening to the two previous speakers and that they actually did not really tackle the issues in hand, but that they were explaining the issues at hand to them from their own respective official stand. This is not a criticism that need you to give it back to me. But this is just an observation. I very often nowadays feel somewhat frustrated. I'm frustrated because given a special opportunity that we are being given to discuss, to exchange views on particular issues, we don't seem to be able to tackle of it head on. Yet, we keep on trying to apologize as to why this or that could not be done. And this is normally account accompanied by various promises. And I want to tell you, my life has been long. I've been there, facing all sorts of issues. And I can tell you, each time when I listen to VVIPs and people with authority, it seems that the issues are put up again and again, and that tackling issues had always been done independently of each other, whereas issues are always interlinked with others, especially in the issue of running a country. Now, some of you who know me, poor Musa, he's always been wanting to be prime minister, except for Dr. Mahathir. Don't laugh, it's serious. Issues faced by us are numerous, at infinitum. In other words, it goes on and on and never end. Well, this is what we are all about. But in Malaysia, I think we could and should focus on particular issues, list them, number one, what are the issues? Number two, what are the ones that are of importance in terms of numbering? Number three is that we must understand how to treat these issues, to accept the issues. And number four, to look at the possible consequences that we decide to take action on and be prepared to face these consequences. 
We are here tonight to focus on the issue of resetting the Malaysian economy, very precisely. Resetting the Malaysian economy, which by itself means that we are not quite happy with the current economic situation as to wish to reset it, that we must accept to be the sentiment, the knowledge, the wish of those who are present here. Well, okay, we can say something wrong here, is there, and everywhere. The public gives on issues, uh, throw issues to us, to us, to, not to, to us, me, no. To them, maybe there's one representative only here. <clears throat> Issues relating to the eggs, egg, egg, tello, tello. Every day, the issue of the egg price, every day, through TV, through radio, through discussions, Whenever we talk, again and again and again. Well, this is the tiny one. The big ones are issuing or issues relating to huge projects that involve not hundreds, but thousands of ringgit. Yet, talked about Yet, as time goes by, we realize it had been mishandled rather than handled in accordance to the legal law demands in trying to implement the projects as intended to be. We can list the issues relating to economy. We understand that it is difficult. We understand also that it will take time for the government to act on it. And the beautiful thing, not beautiful, rather maybe interesting thing about this new government is that indeed it is a new government so that when the minister stands before us, he could easily say, and accepted by everybody, that the government would make sure the government have ideas, the government would be able to adjust or implement, and this is genuine, acceptable indeed. But I can assure you, Rafizi, my son, maybe, I can assure you, at most, the public will give you three months or six months. After that, they're not going to be polite with you. And it is very difficult for anybody who has been used to be the opposition's finding out all the faults in society and government, very difficult to turn yourself from opposition to government. For example, I drew attention of very important minister, high official in the government. I said, please, when you get up these days, don't say, I will not tolerate this thing or that other thing. 
I'll make sure you'll be caught. We will ensure this and the other will be implemented. But these are the only things that had been done by those in government as time goes by again and again, these are left behind. Town, a time, oh, sorry. <laughs> year in, year out, until next elections. Now, I'm not saying anything out of the ordinary. I can only say one thing, that indeed the issues raised by the minister are the ones which he faces as much as his government is facing. And one of the problems really is not economic. It's not even be social or educational or anything. It's politics and government, my friend. It's politics in government that is determining the success or failure of your promises to the rest of the country. Very good explanations are given, for example, by our distinguished speaker. I must tease him by telling you publicly, Rais, you just took the opportunity of this so-called panel discussion to pour out your wishes and hopes and aspirations in this particular institution of government, i.e. parliament. All the things you express, uh, express to us, especially in aspects relating to the judiciary, the law, regulations, as well as expenditure that you are beholden to in order to progress, and your wish to be separate from the rest of the government and to be independent, have been talked about for quite some time. But it happens that you are the only one who's very, very vocal it all the time. Yet you were with the Prime Minister recently. I hope you at least have got agreement by the Prime Minister. Okay, I will look into it. Come on. Man. The time of looking into it should not be allowed. No more, no more, no more. You, the new government, you are in it now. Get on with it. All the issues in the economy, in social issues, economic issues, social issues, political issues even, government, these have been talked about again and again. How do you tackle it? How are you going to be sure that Two years later, it is still not done. At the end of the year, the government falls. And a new group, people will say, okay, I will look into it again. Now, very comforting assurance by Mr. Minister, 
saying that the political situation is stable. No, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> really, really. I'm, not, I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm serious. Hmm? We wonder what is going to happen anytime. Certain groups are with you, yet not with you. Certain individuals promise one thing or the other. It goes on and on, but I, can't, I would like to tell you, in the history of Malaysian politics, I can tell you, we never could be sure what is around the corner. What am I talking about? I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about politics. I'm talking politics because it is politics that would be able to help you to reset the economy. Actually, to begin with, we need to remind ourselves that in spite, in spite of all other issues, non-political, it is actually politics and government first that need resetting. They need resetting. They need revision. They need to be looked into. Not enough. Need to be acted on. One issue after another. And put the political and governmental issues together, and this is where the reform starts, not the other way around. Now, when I was sitting down there, I was conscious of time. I was grumbling a bit that when I was asked to come, I was going to attend, to attend a discussion, a panel discussion. Wow, my God, I said, this is an opportunity. I would sit up, up here with Rafizi by my side and uh, Rais opening ceremony and then we exchange views and then we open it for discussion and questions. That was what I expected to be. And, and I want to tell you, this is an old, 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 old man, or orang tua. I am the orang tua. The orang tua is doing belatering. Belate, belate, belate. This is difficult to understand. Belate means, what do you say in English? That's what I'm doing. My belatering is that. You know, you talk about opportunity to exchange views, to have this. Then we sit down. After that, we come back. We go home. The idea of panel discussion is good, but that question and answer is not here. So please do it again. If you do it, do it better. Better, you do it more, but less formal, sir. You cannot <laughs> claim this gathering to be rakyat oriented. No, no, no. They would not dare come here. It is opportunity for those who, are, who, who could be to come here. 
the potential of this gathering like this is huge. Mr. Speaker, you did come to me. We did talk about it. We required, required we, we accepted the fact that the population, especially the young, need this exposure. But they don't need lecturing, being told what to do. That's why we need to have dialogue opportunity for them. I'm told those are the young ones. For them, sir, can I tell you something? I, I'm, I'm sorry. Blete, blete, blete. I'm, I'm growling about it. But I think I must take the opportunity, opportunity here Rude as I might sound behind you, I can assure you, I'm not like that, but I am not trying to shame anybody on this particular occasion. Get on with it, number one, Mr. Minister. Get on with it. Get on with it. Don't tell us. I'm thinking about it. No, we think about it. You have been thinking. Go on with it. On everything you talk, talk about, within six months, we should be happy or sad. Nothing has happened or have happened. Number one. Number two, get on with the idea of getting the young to be together with us some of us to appear behind, uh, in front, together with them, to exchange views, listening to them. You cannot imagine how out of date we are, how much out of touch we are in many issues. And it is from them they can educate us and expose us about what this country is all about. That's all. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Yang Amat Berbahagia, Tun. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now is the part where we have a question and answer session. I would like to invite the floor for questions. If you have any questions, please introduce yourself and, and to whom you want to address your question to. I would like to remind everyone that we don't have the luxury of time, so please keep your questions short and to the point. And I have to apologize beforehand, we may have to keep it short. With all means, I open um, questions to the floor. Any questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Assalamualaikum. Uh, it is very lovely tonight to see all the professionals and all the orang-orang veteran. So I'm uh, Kamaru Zaman daripada NZ Global uh, Transportation, NZ Global Logistics. So I would like I would like to bukan tanya soalan. I'm here just to give my opinion to share apa yang YB Rafizi bagi tahu lah. We firstly we support the government and hope to have many glasses for drinking for everybody. So I begin with not with politics, but to broaden the government revenue. 
Whereby as what been said by the Prime Minister, the Honourable Prime Minister, they were told that we are working to make the economy grow. So as a local businessman, we have the passion to work with the government. So give us the opportunity to NZ Global Logistics so that we can run the seaports, the land logistics and the cross-border transportation, which is working during bad times and good times. So this is a business that the country should focus because it is a 24-7-7-11, transportation of 7-11. We are not talking about the 7-11, we are talking about the transportation industry. Every country is talking about shipping, is talking about transportation, is talking about cross-border transportation. Tapi our country, we always look for foreigners to come in. We forgot that the local businessmen boleh buat. We have, the pa we have the passion. So please open the window for the local businessmen to come in into this industry. Selalu kita cerita, kita nak syarikat international masuk. Ni syarikat Malaya ni pun boleh buat. So we have the passion. So minta YB dalam ekonomis ni, tak ada benda yang susah. Selalu kita cerita benda ni susah. Mana benda tu tak ada susah pun. Orang tua-tua dah beritahu dah tak ada benda yang susah. Cuma kita minta berilah opportunity for us to work. So if the local transportation company macam kami ni dapat bekerja, we can always call the foreign people to come in. Tapi nampak sekarang ni kami ni di belakang kan, tak diberi window. So minta lagi sekali. Okay, Encik Kamar Zaman, terima bagi kasih. Peluang. Thank sudah you. Kamar Zaman? Kamar Zaman. Kita, uh, tujuan sudah sampai, yeah. jadi kita minta yang berhormat untuk yeah. uh, membuat uh, jawapan. Ini cerita dengan kasih sayang ni. <laughs> di uh, di tak ada soalan tadi so, uh, jadi <laughs> saya terima saya dengar um, of course the ideal situation is that um, everyone can grow and compete um, and ideally we don't even need government to lend a hand here and there um, so they are part of it, I suppose, in the past, you know, the bureaucracy, the intervention here and there. So my view is, if we entangle, you know, sorry, I mean, dismantle as many of these as possible, I don't think we will be needing in the future people coming and say that, give us the opportunity, because hopefully the opportunity is all abandoned. The government, I think, in the future should not be in a position to give here and there, intervene here and there. It's basically to allow um, the ecosystem and, and for people to really compete and make it as easy as possible to grow and to participate. And so as an objective, it sounds ideal. That is like for harm, there are so many, um, as I say, tapes here and there along the way and that's what we hopefully we will dismantle um, but as I say there are decisions after decisions that have to be made very quickly in the first four or five months and once the key ones that cover the fiscal position and so on then we can start and I think the message through the whole economy and through the whole government um, machinery I think the message will be picked up and then hopefully we'll see you uh, transporting all over South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Berhormat. One more question. We have one more question over here. I think, unfortunately, this is going to be the last question. Tak apa, kalau ada satu lagi boleh tambah. Tak cukup dengan dua je. I have in to, in to intervene. Please, go on. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Denison J. Surya. Um, I think as uh, already mentioned by the speakers, uh, dialogue of this nature is very important, especially for non-parliamentarians to muscle, get an opportunity uh, to raise questions, to have similar experiences. And I think I would like to congratulate both speakers of the House for this opportunity. Thank you. Secondly, which is my question, 
uh, to the minister and maybe even uh, our turn to draw from his years of experience as DPM and as MP. To what extent would the government empower grassroots communities to have a greater say in local development matters? Uh, because we find a lot of top-down economic planning, very little of grassroots communities, whether fishing community, paddy farmers, uh, small town development, island development. How would we empower them to provide input to EPU, the planning process, uh, and to strengthen grassroots democracies? Thank you very much. Silicon. Thank you, Doctor. In fact, you know, that's, that's on the point, basically. Um, we are working, um, you know, in the next few weeks to launch um, a, an, a grassroots-based um, poverty elevation program. In the past, what happened was that government will pick from a lease and just disperse 10, 20,000, and then that's it. Um, we're going to shift the approach completely. We will be working with as many social enterprises as possible. Um, we want to make sure that there's a sustainability and we want to bring in the local community to work with it. So there will be a shift, um, and, but of course, implementation-wise, it will be in stages. We have to do a few pilots all over the place first, see how it works, and then if this pilot um, case works well, um, by half a year, we hope to scale up all over uh, the country. So, um, at my ministry, is, you know, we, we've been talking about that. Uh, the stakeholders are very different nowadays. And precisely because, as I said, we need to be more agile, the channel is very different than in the past, where one instruction, it goes and it filtered down actually is almost flat now that we have to work with as many CSOs and community groups. Um, in the past, for example, if we want to push certain policies, say dengan Belia, you work with Persatuan Belia. Uh, and Persatuan Belia has layers daripada daerah all the way up. The hierarchical nature of that is not as effective as, for example, different groups locally based, community driven, um, where they take stake in, in, in their surrounding and you work um, in lateral with as many such groups as possible. It is more difficult to administer, the risk is slightly higher because it's, it's not as um, control as before, it's no longer as in control environment and you have to manage the stakeholders process um, a lot more rigorously but there's no two ways about it because government cannot um, control and manage everything anymore. Um, there's a limit to how much we can know and we can plan. Um, we hopefully will be able to set the parameters allocate the resources and channel those resources to empower such social enterprise and local communities to work together and we are ho hopefully we will test it with um, um, poverty elevation program first because we want to plug them into the food value chain by community but of course, you can't just give it to them. The government then have to bring different different stakeholders and players along the value chain and, and, and plug them and uh, assist um, the local community to work. Um, and hopefully, if that works, then that certainly will take more chunk of um, our efforts going forward. So, you know, the plan is um, February. So it's um, in about a few days, um, hopefully um, we'll, get, we'll give more info. But of course, again, um, this is also which I hope um, and I realize is a lot easier working with your social enterprise with just about 
100 people, then working with one social price and scaling it up to millions of people. Uh, the risk of um, it is not going as your plan, the implementation risk is a lot higher. So that's why you know, we will take some months to pilot it, but if it's okay, most probably we want to make sure that it's going to be the mainstay of um, basically policy approach in the future. We thank the minister for the answer. Uh, lady, I would, I would take on as an intervener so that oh. we go a bit faster, okay? Yeah, sure. And that answer was good, I think, in terms of theory. But coming back to what the tone said, maybe it has just gone halfway. Can we have the next question? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, Tun, would you like to comment? I'm sorry. I would like to comment. I would like to comment on the last question. Um, simple, simply, simply put, uh, there are two ways, two methods of uh, the riot reaching uh, the government. Number one, as long as our system is called uh, parliamentary democracy, we could use these representatives uh, as go between, if you like, in issues relating to the interests of the riot. Uh, I noticed that many representatives or um, are, who, are, who are members of parliament or state, some of them really establish their own centers as well as giving opportunity for the riot to approach them directly. The second way is to try to empower um, uh, organizations or clubs at the lower level. And I get the impression that nowadays they are less active but more so in ceremonies rather than serious issues being brought up. Those are the two things I, I would like to offer to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dun. Less ceremony and more uh, abrupt reaction. Uh, can we have the last uh, question again? Your name? My name is uh, Mugunta. Dun, can we have one from the women, please? The lady, the oh, the lady, you mean? Yes. Uh, maybe. Oh um, yes. Okay. You got the floor because first? you raise your hand first. All right. Maybe uh, kita ringkas ya. Kemudian sebab masa dah berjalan. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, saya good Rufaini. evening. And it's a great pleasure to meet my hero YB Rafizi here. Oh uh, well, let me make a ruling here. <laughs> first is who chose to raise the hand first? The lady or was it the gentleman? The, the gentleman. The gentleman. Yes. Uh, jadi puan uh, kijap ya. Uh, Please. Okay, I have a very perplexing question in my mind. Uh, name and then you my know. My name is uh, Mugunta. I'm an architect. Okay. I'm the president of Lango Indian Chamber of Commerce. This matter of, you see, I was looking at uh, Sri Lanka. They have a debt of 50 billion US and they became bankrupt. Pakistan had a debt of 100 billion US. And they became bankrupt. Uh, put the mic to your... They become bankrupt. But what's perplexing to me is, we have a debt of 1,500 billion. And we are happy in this country. We got everything going, even the egg price is going up also, but we are happy. No money also, we are happy. I hope, in an economic point of view, can you... I just cannot figure out, we have 1,500 billion. Pakistan, no electricity, no water, no gas. Sri Lanka, no, Pak no electricity, no gas, no nothing. What's happening? Is this a magic we are going through? I hope why be my hero, can you answer good, this good question? Good question, very clear. Thank you. you see, we have to differentiate just as we run a company between the so-called balance sheet and profit and loss and the cash flow. You see the the debt, you know. Um, um, we have 1.6 trillion uh, ringgit debt, right? 
as a percentage of the size of our economy is, is actually quite comparable. Our problem is with that only 11% tax revenue every year, basically our cash flow is in trouble. And that's exactly if we are not careful and if we don't manage our cash flow well, despite whatever is happening in the economy, the cash flow problem leads to default like Sri Lanka and Pakistan and anywhere, and for that matter, Argentina from time to time. So we have to separate between the so-called cash flow and the, like I always say is fiscal position and fiscal position and the actual economic growth and the economic potential of this country. So to your question, why are we happy? And I know Ton, you know, trying to say, you know, are we happy or not happy? Um, actually, economically, we are not, you know, on, as a country, we have all the potentials. I will not be doing my duty if I come here and say that we are going down. We can do so much better to unlock, but of course, no matter how much the private sector or the economy grows, if the government doesn't manage our fiscal spending and our fiscal allocation properly, Sri, Sri Lanka we will be some time in the future. So, so that's why um, we have to separate between the two, between facilitating the economy and, and sending the right signal and, uh, and pumping the right allocation so that the, the, the economy continue to grow to reach its potential. But we also have to have the fiscal discipline and that's when whatever Tun uh, mentioned is all about politics. Those are the politics bit. Uh, corruption, mismanagement, bureaucracy, um, the, you know, the, the, the lack of political decisiveness, those hopefully is what is our duty so that we will have a much better fiscal position. Then you know, we can see that while the economy grows, whatever the government gets, it will be ploughed back and people can feel you know, the fact that it's really in tandem with economic growth. Thank you, YB. Uh, Ton, would you like? To, to uh, just one word. <laughs> one word means a few. <laughs> that is, uh, make it simply, make it simple, um, with due respect to Rafizi, all the explanation is there, but that relates to people who understand better. But the ordinary people don't understand. They are like you and me. To me, it is simply, simple, simple, simpler if I to tell you, if I can tell you that one of the strength of the Malaysian economy is that we have natural resources as well as the fact that we do have responsible leadership when it comes to issues that affect us. I'll stop there. Thank you, Don. Uh, yes, we more. need one more? Yes, the uh, lady. From, yeah. uh, the lady at the back there. Uh, nama dengan uh, uh, okay. tempat kerja ataupun uh, wakil siapa? Sila. Uh, saya Rozaini binti Muhammad Rusli, uh, PhD candidate dalam science politik di IIUM. Oh, pengkaji science politik, ya? Yeah? Ya. Yeah. So, uh, Rafizi, you mentioned about, you know, uh, imp you implied about implication, uh, the standard of living of Malaysians. And uh, I gather that the two factors uh, contributing to that would be the cost of living and the um, uh, income level uh, of the people. So, um, Actually, uh, there are other issues related, for instance... Could you climate, be more focused yeah. so that the question is there? Yeah, the, you didn't say about climate change and how it affects the ec people, economy, uh, the outcome of those uh, disasters and things like that. Question, man. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> and also you mentioned about subsidies, you know, all these are interrelated, but yes, I... Uh, agree that you need to be more uh, focused and 
to outline you exactly must, what, me, madam, what you want madam, uh, to... Yeah. Pardon me, listen. Yes. Please put up your question. So what, what do you think or what are you going to do with the subsidies and expenditure of the government to improve cost of living and also the uh, level of income of the people? Thank Great. you very much. Now the answer can come. We, we, the subsidy bill for 2022, I think, will hit about 80 plus billion, you know. Um, and the subsidy bill goes to everyone. And so, um, what we will do is that um, this idea that by right, if you have one basic income level, that um, anything below that government has to supplement at least to be able to to live a decent life and i mean that's macam tun will say times we will say that's in theory it is in theory and the reason it remains in theory until today when everyone expects it to be done and if we do that we will be able to save 20 plus billion going forward from time to time from which we can plow back to many other more important sectors. The reason it remains in theory is because for us to be able to do that, we need the whole infrastructure to do that. That means that the data infrastructure has to be in place. The um, delivery infrastructure has to be in place. So we hope by rationalization of subsidy, by targeting, it means that it gives it goes directly to those families who are really in need and we can consolidate all the fragmented cash aid here and price subsidy here, fuel subsidy there, consolidate it ideally into one universal cash aid and then it goes directly to household. Um, once we do that, we will be able to strengthen our fiscal um, condition we will have extra billions and those extra billions will go back to education to health because that health for example is going to be a high cost going forward and we are slowly becoming an aging society um, you know and it will cost a lot more for me 10 15 years down the line for example than than maybe Tansri and Tun now um, and we live longer nowadays. You know? So, um, in that sense, I think that's why as I started my speech by saying the easy part of this administration task is the diagnosis. The diagnosis has been spoken about for decades. Uh, is the get on to it that is difficult. And that is the bit that I say we have actually quite a small window because all these key decisions, the get on part, has to be done in a matter of months. Because once those big decisions are done, it does take some time to put all the infrastructure in place, to consolidate, and you start, you roll out the pilot test, and start, then you scale up to the whole country. Um, as much as it sounds extremely complicated if you are looking at it from from government's perspective, and that's why it was very difficult to get to, to, to be done in the last one decade. Once I think we make those decisions and we start the first few steps, everything else I think will move so much faster that hopefully within two to three years, um, we don't have this discussion anymore. And that's, I think, my task. Um, that's why I say hopefully within one year, um, if I come back here, I can tell straight away whether I fail in my first year or not. But now, all those six months, hopefully by then, turn some of the key decisions have been on the table for a very long time. It just needs to be done, and, but I think within six months, I, I'm quite positive it will be done. Yeah, so far, yeah. All right? Okay? Uh, terima kasih yang berhormat uh, saudara Rafizi. Uh, saya berjanji tadi supaya kumpulan dapat lima soalan ya. Yeah? Uh, one more? Actually, there are two gentlemen. Uh, which one you you saw first? I think the gentleman. The one in black. The batik, yeah. The one in batik first. Yes. Sorry. A lot earlier. Uh, terima kasih. Brief and to the point. 
Okay, uh, I'll sc- j- j- jump straight into it. So I want to use um, YB's... Uh, sorry, my name is Chuck. I run a website called My MP, which monitors MPs. Um, I wanted to ask um, about YB's metaphor of Malaysia is obese. And uh, a lot of people um, in the States who are obese use wheelchairs. And I wanted to ask all three of you whether you guys would consider low-skilled foreign labor a wheelchair. And whether or not we want to get... Low-skilled foreign labor... Yeah, low-skilled foreign labour, do you consider that a wheelchair and do you think that we need to do something about it in the years to come and what is that? Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, and, and that's why you notice uh, lately I do pick, you know, um, um, respond to, for example, um, price elasticity and about consumer behaviour and so on because sometimes, in some cases, we do get addicted to something. And we do get addicted to foreign, cheap foreign labors. It's just that because we have been addicted to cheap foreign labors, that's why we are stuck with so-called um, low-cost um, uh, manufacturing economy. So it's, it's a painful thing uh, that we have to do. I'm going to sit down, for example, with restaurant tours next in the next few weeks because. We have to move away from employing foreign laborers in our FNB. Um, we have to um, allow for we we have to get used, for example, of not having waitresses working full time. They come in the morning when there's peak, there's a lull, you have less. So instead of saying, you know, I need someone who can stay there from seven o'clock in the morning to twelve midnight, because that's what foreign laborers do, most probably you have to manage different shifts at different time. It's, it sounds more complicated now, but unless we remove that wheelchair, uh, you know, we will continue to be obese. So, yes, on the spot. Finally, one more. Yes, lady, yes, whom did you see first? Uh, the, the gentleman at the back. Silicon. Tolong uh, ringkas. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Iskandar. I'm a legal practitioner. <coughs> uh, regarding resetting the economy, what the I have to go straight to the point. What the PM10 has done by executing the Malaysia Agreement 1963 is actually resetting the economy. From PM1 until PM9, no one has actually was very serious. Were very serious in implementing in honoring the agreement. I'm talking about my area, law, legal. Why does a legal practitioner need a special permission to go to Sarawak court, to appear in Sabah court, to handle only a single case? Every time we need to be given a permission, we need Immigration permit. What is this? But Thank you, Encik Iskandar. Yes. Uh, as compared to the Sabahan, the Sarawakian, the legal practitioner, they are free. All they right. can come and set. So can we improve on this? In addition to honoring what are the rights of Sabahan, Sarawakian, but can we balance it up? If we have to amend a bit the agreement, can we do that? These are resetting. Right, the, right. The, the I'm the sure um, the panelists Thank got you. the question. So sorry for, 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 yes. for being too, a bit personal about this is my area. I need to, to do this every time I have case there. Thank you. I, I, I think that there's only, always two sides of the same coin. You know, that, that is the perspective from us in Semenanjung, but obviously if, if we are in Sabah and Sarawak, the perspective is different. The perspective is that everything has been so lopsided that you know we um, in Sabah and Sarawak feel that they have not caught up with development. Again. So as much as it is a political question, because of course you can always go and negotiate and negotiate and negotiate, but at least from the economic perspective, I think um, you know, the, the um, spillover from what we are trying to do to um, make it more equitable um, 
eventually hopefully builds and close the gap so much so that I think the Sabah and Sarawak and the Semenanjung see as a whole economic unit without having to say this is my territory and my economic cake and that's yours. And it's, it is a process. Um, um, I still, same like everyone else, you know, I, I still have to, in fact, I was still banned um, and only, you know, when I was in, in Sarawak last Friday, uh, it's only at the airport they realised that um, despite being a minister now, I'm still banned in Sarawak, but they very quickly removed the ban. Lah. Um, but I, I think, uh, Iskandar, I think hopefully uh, it is a process that we close as much economically because it's, it's economic in nature to a certain extent. Uh, the origin of it was economy in nature. So once it feels more equitable to the Sabah and Sarawak, I think it's a lot easier to talk about renegotiating or re, you know, allowing a more free flow of professionals between Sabah, Sarawak and Semenanjo. Pardon me, YB. We are, not, we are not setting up the office there. Just a si sing single case from time to time. I think that sorry, is sorry, answered, sorry, and to be fair, we distribute yes. it. We have had five? Yes. Yes. I leave we have six. Six already? Yes. Okay, I, I, I leave it back to you. I think that's a fair number. Right. Um, uh, that marks the end of the question and answer session. For those who still have that burning question that needs to be asked, um, you know, the kind that can, wouldn't let you fall asleep tonight, um, you can email us your questions. And just like the practice in the Dewan Rakyat and Dewan Negara, you'll get a written answer, probably. <laughs> My takeaway word for today is, get on with it. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the next item, I promise you this is the, almost the last item, uh, is a presentation of Momento. I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia Datuk Nur Yahati Awang, a Chief Administrator of Parliament to accompany Yang Berhormat Senator Tan Sri Datuk Sri Utama Dr. Rais Yatim to the front for this small ceremony. This event, I would like to thank everyone for your participation in making this event a success. Hopefully, we'll meet again in the coming Parliament Lecture Series. A reminder from the Secretariat, please scan the QR code on the security pass obtained from the security upon entrance. Failure to do so, you'll have problem leaving the parliament compound. I shall leave you with a loose translation of an old Malay pantun. If there is a broken needle, don't keep it inside a wooden crate. If there is any blunder on my part, don't keep it in your heart. Thank you. With that, I wish you good night. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And thank you.